Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Regan Bowden, and I, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the fifth webinar in this Global Surgery webinar series, co-hosted by UCT Surgical Society and the UCT Division of Global Surgery. The last couple of weeks, we've been bringing you insights and experiences into global surgery and surgery in general, and what it means and its importance in our context. We've had various speakers from different divisions within health and healthcare, each experts in their own rights, presenting up to us in really engaging and helpful ways. I've no doubt that today will be the same. We have two excellent speakers and educators. Everyone at UCT will know them and know their faces and be really excited to hear from them. Um, they're gonna to present to us some of their expertise, some of their experiences, and some of their theories that ground their practice. Uh, during the conversation, uh, you can feel free to message any questions you have for the speakers, either to me or to Katie via the chat function, and we'll bring them all up at the end as much as we can. If this is your first webinar in the series, welcome. We hope it's informative and helpful. Um, we, this has been a series though, so we would love you to try and watch as many of the previous ones as possible. You can watch them by searching UCT Surgical Society on YouTube and the rest will be there. You can engage with us on Twitter by following the Division of Global Surgery on at Global UCT and Surgical Society by following at UCT SurgSoc. A reminder that the goal of this webinar series is to instill the understanding, passion and skills in every person who attends to play valuable and important roles in providing safe, timely and accessible care to the people around us. So whether you're an undergraduate student, a surgical consultant, or a casual observer, we hope that this helps you do that today. I, it's my pleasure to introduce the head of surgery at UCT and, and uh, Clotus Gear Hospital, Professor Fegan, to introduce the speakers for tonight. So Regan, thank you very much and welcome to everybody who's joining this fifth in this amazing uh, series of webinars. Um, many, many people think about um, surgery as really something that's, that's done by surgeons, but in order for surgery to happen, uh, a whole complex ecosystem uh, needs to be in place to enable the patient to safely um, venture into operating theater and sort of survive an operation and, and, and uh, leave hospital in, in good health. And the two speakers today really are, are in, in a wonderful position to, to really help kind of convey the, 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 the sense in which um, surgical care man uh, functions within a very well integrated system. So Shrikant Peters is a, a public health uh, physician who um, helps run our, our theater complex at Kriliskia and Rowan Dace is a specialist anesthetist um, also at Kriliskia Hospital. And, and they're gonna be um, talking a lot about the, the kinds of activities that go into running surgical services and hopefully there'll be time for some very vibrant discussion after their talks, which I'm sure will be stimulating and provocative, knowing both of them quite well. So we're going to start with Sri. Um, in fact, the other thing that they both have in common, they're both UCT graduates, which is, which is kind of nice. Sri graduated from UCT in 2010 um, and then went on to, to do a BA in UNICEF in politics, philosophy and economics, the so so-called PPE, which is why he's so incredibly erudite. He completed his internship at Addington Hospital in Durban, community service in Cape Town at Easter River, and then he worked as an MO in Hilbra. So he really kind of covered, covered the country before setting down to specialize in public health medicine. And we were, we were incredibly fortunate in that um, many of the public health registrars um, in their last year of service come and work in the hospital. And uh, we were very fortunate to have Shree come work in the main theater complex at Friliskia. And once he arrived, um, within weeks, we were never gonna let him go. And, and happily, he's now been employed actually as a medical manager at Friliskia. So his job really is taking care of the um, kind of operational and day-to-day -day functioning of theaters. But it really, he, he plays a much broader role uh, in the sort of healthcare ecosystem in terms of kind of really having an understanding of how, how the systems work in an integrated way and how one can constantly strive to improve the quality of the service that we offer. So Sri, you've been an incredible breath of fresh air in theater. <clears throat> I never ever thought that, um, that surgeons would warm so much to, to, to public health, uh, but you've been a, a one person, unbelievable a sort of advocate for, for public, health, a public health approach. And a lot of what you've done has really laid the groundwork of the acceptance of the global surgery approach at Kritzke Hospital. So it's a real pleasure 
uh, to, to welcome you to this webinar and ask you to give this talk. Um, thank you very much, Prof. Um, I'm happy to be here, as you know. Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen and just make sure that uh, you can see me. Let me just do that properly. Share screen. There we go. Great. So, um, yes, so Prof, as Prof Egan said, um, my name is Frikant. Uh, I am in theatre, and if you'd asked me 10 years ago when I qualified where I would be, um, it would not be in theatre, it would not be back at Kurzgeier Hospital. Um, but here I am. Um, I, I always tell my classmates I never thought I'd end up in theatre, and they very specifically tell me, you're in an office in theatre. But there my scrubs are, um, and I, I get into them from time to time when I need to walk inside. So what is a theater manager? Because I, I brought my mother here once, um, and uh, she looked at my door, and it said theater manager. And she said, but, no, but, but it should say doctor. It should say um, uh, doctor, doctor theater manager. And I said, well, that kind of title doesn't exist. So how do you make a theater manager? And we're getting into what goes into managing um, services and it's um, a precursor to you know the necessary things you need to run a surgical team which is a completely different kettle of fish as Rowan will tell you. So the concept of theatre manager there's no bachelors in theatre management um, you sort of fall into it and then you sink or swim but so I was a medical student um, at UCT I did PBL and BHP and BADR um, and I learned all these things about anatomy and pathology, physiology, um, and I learned how to, to examine and, 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 and diagnose and manage it. They called me safe and they let me out into the world. Um, uh, then I became a clinician and it was, uh, I had to do my clinical rotations. I saw patients on the floor um, and then I was an independent practitioner after my time in community service. And then I said, the system stinks, right? things don't work, we don't have the right equipment, the right resources. Um, there's no one who looks like they're in charge because the system is just completely dysregulated um, and supply and demand is just not linked. So I did public health because I wanted to have an effect on the system. And at the end of my time, I came back into management in a hospital and I saw what crisis management looks like because that's what um, being in management as a, at a hospital looks like. So there is no such thing as a theater manager and maybe we must change that and maybe that's something global surgery can look at but it is what i am now whatever my mother thinks so today uh, i wanted to talk to you about healthcare systems then we're going to focus in on theater management and i'm going to give you a little overview of the theory of quality improvement before rowan takes us away so systems when i think about a system right everyone uses the term but i really like this watch face and i use it in my lectures and it really shows that a system is something that has a singular purpose, this is to tell time, um, but it has lots of little levers and processes that interact with each other. And if you switch one of those little things, everything else changes. And we've seen this in COVID, where we've changed the way one ward functions and it has ripple effects on every other department in the hospital. But really, when we talk the healthcare system, we talk about um, six specific things and, and a very complex thing in the middle there you can see which makes it very difficult to manage. But we talk about the health system, which is the six building blocks. I'm going to take you through those specific to theater. So the Lancet Commission published the, the three delays framework, and we know how difficult it is just to get patients from the community to the CHCs to the district level hospital and into higher level care. And global surgery has very, done very well to tell the thread of that story. But where we are today is at higher level secondary and tertiary hospital. And I want to take that part of the diagram and explode it for you. So I got back to Hritzkia yeah, and I came straight. I mean, at first I came from Hillbrow, which is a very small, poorly functioning clinic in the middle of Joburg Central. Um, and the end of my rage time brought me back to what I think of as the palace of, of, of um, South African and Southern African healthcare. And, and you see it there. It looks beautiful. It is beautiful. And, you know, you, you cry when you're on the outside and, you ask for a web call in deepest, darkest KZN, and they say, what's a web call? And you cry and <laughs> you think of Hrutskia. But if you, if you think of, you see this as, as, a, as a student, and you know, you, you know that there's professionals that work hard here, and they do their best, and, and the place looks like it runs very well. 
But I have to tell you that to, for that to happen, you need governance, you need the money, you need the, the infrastructure, you need quality improvement, you need data, and obviously you need the people um, and, and you need to train them up. It doesn't happen just automatically. And we assume that it should happen automatically um, as, as healthcare professionals. So um, what does it look like in theater management? So we've got these six building blocks. We're gonna talk about governance first. So what is governance? Uh, what is a team in theater? Um, we talk about a matrix management style of leadership in theater simply because I'm not a surgeon uh, and I don't think a surgeon was ever in medical management in theater. Um, there are various um, layers of managers, as you can see in that diagram there, but we all at the end of the day need a functional team. And that functional team in theater is made up of nurses, doctors, um, administrative staff and allied health practitioners that all have to come together to deliver care. Um, the, the theater space is not like a ward where if you don't have a nurse with you to put in a, 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 a CVP under sterile conditions, you just make a plan and do it yourself. Uh, you don't have a scrub sister in theater, you can't do the case. Um, we have a set of complex um, of, of, of behaviors and attitudes and principles which underlie the way in which we govern a system. And we supposedly hang all of the work that we do on standards uh, and standard operating procedures. And we try our best to stick to those procedures, otherwise it's chaos. If you wanna look at the emergency board, if the surgeons don't stick to their rules, it's chaos. Um, and we have a, a way in which we've tried to imagine leading the space. And we, we focused a lot on, on leadership and team development. We want to manage our systems daily. We wanna have data-driven theaters. And we look at specific indicators on a monthly, weekly, daily basis, where we try to increase the amount of utility, we try to decrease the, the risk of adverse events, and we want to deliver a high quality um, service um, with, uh, with a, not low cost, but a, a, a good use of public finances. Be that as it may, I mean, the demand for care outstrips supply. This is a, a graph of uh, the emergency theater waiting time. And over the last 10 years, the amount of waiting done on the emergency board, which is linked to morbidity and mortality, um, you know, has grown. But the issue is someone has to hold the space and understand what the waiting time is and pull on the levers, um, policy, governance, human resources, to try and turn these graphs the right way. Otherwise, clinicians sit with this problem and feel powerless um, to, to, to deal with the wider system that they can't change. Human resources, nursing staff, how do you sort this out? So we have teams um, at complex level, at theater level, who are having meetings, looking at these indicators um, very regularly, trying to change them and, and, and manage them accordingly. So medicines and technology. Um, if you look at something like D21, which is our cardiothoracic theater, which is called the Chris Barnard hybrid theater. Um, I had to explain to the National Core Standards people who Chris Barnard was. I found that it was weird. Um, it doesn't happen by itself. There's, there's equipment in there that is worth millions of rands. The stuff in the walls, the electricity and the uninterrupted power supplies um, and the equipment that's in there. I mean, ECMO, I hadn't heard of as an undergraduate student. I wasn't a particularly gifted undergraduate student. Um, but we have modalities which um, can now sustain life long past wherever we could in the 1950s and at the time of the first heart transplant. But it requires money. It requires governance structures in place. Um, finance and supply chain, this is something... So if you look at our GDP, don't think about 2020 and COVID, but pre-COVID, GDP of 5.1 trillion. If you break that down, GSH theaters at the end of the day, out of a provincial budget of about 25 billion, we use 600 million rands in this theater um, with staffing equipment supplies. Um, and that's what I'm in charge of. And that's what I'm, I have to use to deliver the maximal utility that I can. Um, when I do that, I have to stick to certain um, rules in place uh, which govern uh, expenditure. You hear these things about fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Um, if we have services but not in the right puzzle piece uh, pieces, then we don't actually spend properly. Um, and then there's supply chain. You can buy the equipment, you can buy the stacks, you can buy the ECMO, um, but if you haven't 
done the proper ordering and asset management, it's still a nightmare and it can still leave you open to fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Um, and as dry as these things were in, in uh, undergraduate, I would never have ever thought of these things. But if this doesn't happen in the background, theater doesn't run. Who has that overlying view of what theater looks like? How many rooms we are operating on a day? Where do we send patients? To, where do we send staff members to um, as the um, operating requirements demand? Um, when we have new theaters being built um, we have people who are creating the theaters, who are building them, engineers who are interacting with hospital management, but who translates what the clinicians need on the floor. Um, and that's the job of theater management. And you would hopefully have something from finance and human resources, and you need to have some sort of clinical background to understand why you need a separate donning and doffing room for a COVID theater. Um, information, which is huge. In the Western Cape, we're, and, and this is where we have to tie health systems together, what we, what we have is a single unique patient identifier, and that's the backbone of, of those, those, those um, little pies you see in the middle there. And we link together data from Clinicom, from uh, the clinics, from prescriptions, from uh, discharge notes, and now uh, also the theater space to create electronic health records that clinicians can use. Um, uh, and those cogs in the center, it's a very complicated diagram, but it's what public health specialists have created to show you that if we use data sufficiently and we, if we, if we um, stitch it together in the right way, it's not just research, it's something that should be live and influence our decision making on the floor and be available to clinicians on a daily basis. Um, so eventually what we want uh, in theater, and this is being uh, run by a couple of public health specialists in town is a theater information system where we uh, melt together all the data that we have. We understand our start times, our turnaround times. We know what clinicians are booking um, and we know the kinds of outcomes we're getting from our theater. And we really want to have an academic approach to theater management in that way. And we, we're looking to global surgery to help us with this as well. Um, so human resources, big, um, point, uh, every intern, every student will know that um, there are reports around the country of um, doctors out of jobs and, and knowing that we need doctors. The issue isn't that we, we, we don't want doctors, it's just that we don't necessarily have the money to employ them. Government might have money for other things and other sorts of uh, wasteful expenditures, but we don't have enough for what we want to do. And we, there's a, a finite supply of doctors and there's a very finite supply of theater trained nurses, which is actually a crisis, uh, that we can have all the doctors we want, but we just don't have enough registered nurses who are theater trained to do the work that we need to do in this country. And it's a, it's a problem in South Africa and the world over, something we grapple with on a daily basis. When we talk service delivery, what do you mean by service delivery? Um, in public health, we're taught to process map um, uh, services from start to finish, from the time you get into theater to the time that you, you leave and go to ICU, high care, or the wards, and you map out exactly everything in that. Now, if you, you can see the picture in your head as a student, but if you actually want to measure and manage each of these steps, you have to think of each of them separately. Um, and these are where frameworks come into play. And this is called the SIPOC framework, where we look at what are the supplies and inputs we need to run theater? All of the different things we do in theater can be measured, managed, and improved. And the outputs that we get out of theater, we want to maximize uh, and minimize in the case of, of morbidity and mortality. So we've got certain baseline measures that we want to uh, ensure are, are um, in place. And these are the national core standards. You can see I've blocked off our results because those are um, obviously tightly guarded, but we want at the, at the heart of what we do, we want to run a safe service that's balanced with running the volume of service that we want to. Um, and there's lots of things we need to do to do that. And one of them is the surgical safety checklist. But people, people at the end of the day are the center of all these things. We can have all of the necessary structures in place and I can, I can be in charge of a 600 million rand um, theater service, but if I don't have the people and the trusting relationships of teams it all falls apart. Um, and that's really how you get this data-driven theater with governance of functional teams. You need engaged and proactive staff. And that doesn't just happen by itself. So quality improvement, 
um, is, is something that requires functional teams. Um, and so, so that's where I'll, I'll finish off my part of the talk. Um, just a little bit about quality because it, it means different things to different people and we need to define what it means for surgical care. But just so that you know, don't worry if you're left adrift in what quality means. It's for everyone to define what quality is, to measure it and then improve it over time. And, and everyone understands we want a safe, acceptable, efficient service to run. Um, so as a registrar, just by, by, by way of example, the um, quality improvement topic that I took on was uh, monitoring and improving infections in um, South African hospitals. And so um, uh, this article came out in the SAMJ in the early 2000s. It was one in seven people who enter South African hospitals are at risk of developing an HAI. Um, a healthcare associated infection. And a lot of those are related to indwelling catheters, um, surgical site uh, um, infections after procedures. And so we looked at a bundle of, of, of basic things you can do to decrease surgical site infections. And this was giving people antibiotic prophylaxis before skin incision, um, removing hair without cutting, uh, using a razor and using clippers, keeping normal thermia, normal glycemia, and having a chlorhexidine shower. So these are basic things, very simple things that if you institute, you can decrease your infection rates by two thirds or more, like was done in Mowbray maternity. But to actually get that done, you have to get your stakeholders on board to buy into the process. Um, and so what we do is we try and follow a, a scientific approach. Um, we, as you would in the clinical realm, diagnose, treat and follow up over time, at the systemic level, we, we have a plan for what we want to do. We do it, we study the numbers, we come up with indicators, and then we see whether or not it's worked. And so what scientists, have, social scientists have called the PDSA model is literally the clinical method applied to systems. And the question is, can we take every problem uh, in, a, in the public healthcare sector, can we turn it into indicators and can we take all the things that our stakeholders are telling us about theater and can we commit to running continuous PDSA cycles as managers and clinicians and commit to changing the service for the better? Um, all of those things I told you about at the start, um, the governance, the, the, the infrastructure, the finance, all of that is simply the structures of the system that we deal with. Um, and, and we need to use those to improve the processes of care to have better quality outcomes um, for our patients. Um, but really the outcomes and the process really will only depend on functional teams. Um, you can have the structures in place, but if you don't have trusting team relationships in your healthcare system, you're gonna go nowhere fast. And so that was a whirlwind tour through healthcare management. Um, but if I had one thing to say, we can have PDSAs, we can apply scientific approaches to management and, and leadership. But if we don't have healthcare teams that function, um, we're, we're on a road to nowhere. Uh, and so I, I'm left always thinking about uh, being that intern post call, this is at Addington. Um, uh, and this was waiting for our surgical consultants to finish. I think it was a, a World Cup match um, a while before they did the post intake round. But, but really that's what's so important that we need as clinicians and managers uh, is a team to, if we are to manage our services and improve quality um, in the surgical space. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much for that uh, amazing presentation, Dr. Peters. Uh, it's really a great overview of everything that we really need to know. Um, and it's really cool that we're getting exposure to that from now. Um, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Dace to give his presentation and we'll do questions at the end. Uh, thanks, Regan. Um, let me know if you uh, kind of can't hear me and I'm gonna share my screen now. Right, uh, is the correct screen showing? Regan, can you just come yeah, confirm? Yeah, everything's it? great. Cool. Okay, thanks Regan and, and, and thanks Srikant um, and thanks for kind of setting me up for um, talking about teams in the uh, surgical context. Um, I, uh, my name is Rowan Dace. I'm an anesthetist in the Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine. Um, I'm also the Director of Implementation at UCT Global Surgery. 
I work mainly at Fritzke Hospital, but a couple of other um, hospitals in uh, the metro. Um, and thanks again to the um, Surgical Society for um, hosting me today with Global Surgery. Um, so, you know, I think just to say my interest and passion for a long time has been um, learning and, uh, and how learning and behavior change interact. Um, and, and really, I, I want to be involved in public health through human development. So I think Shri's taught us a lot about kind of the systems um, and the process in the background. Um, but when he kept highlighting that we need teams, we need functional teams, um, that's really where, where I want to be. Uh, um, I want to understand how we unleash the human potential uh, in the system. Um, so, so let's kind of talk a little bit about um, why I think that's important. And, and I'm hoping that this will illustrate a little bit uh, what things look like in practice. And, and you can use the background that Shri's given you to help you think about some of these problems. Um, this is not going to be a, a tour de force by an expert on uh, human behavior. I'm not that guy. Um, I'm an enthusiast. Um, uh, uh, in fact, some would say I have an enthusiasm problem. Um, but I'm hoping that I can prod you a little bit and make you think about um, where you are in the world and where you want to practice and how you think about um, improving systems and unleashing teams. So um, if, you know, I, I'm not sure that there's, there's another paper out there in the world that illustrates the um, issues with global surgery as well as this one. Um, so this is the uh, um, postdoc analysis of the obstetric subset of the ASOS study. If you want to know more about the paper, you can ask Salome. Uh, she wrote it. Um, but the take home message for me is if you have a cesarean section um, in, high, in a high income country or in Africa, the chance of the mom dying uh, around the time of the, of the cesarean delivery is 50 times higher if she's in Africa. And every time I hear that stat, it's like a gut punch, right? 50 times higher mortality around cesarean sections uh, in, in, uh, in Africa. And if that doesn't motivate you to uh, try and change things, I'm not sure what will. But you might say, well, look, you know, that's Africa. South Africa is quite different. Okay, so here's some South African figures. Uh, maternal mortality, so this isn't just cesarean delivery, this is maternal mortality for all obstetric cases, for, um, in the UK is seven per 100,000 live, live births, and in South Africa it's about 150. That's 20 times higher. So what does this have to do with surgical teams, right? Uh, well, the point is that to provide the care that leads to a maternal mortality rate of only seven, in the UK, the NHS uses exactly the same equipment, exactly the same drugs that we have access to. There's nothing fancy. They don't have a, a magic pill. They don't have any toys that we don't have access to in this country. It's their system that's better. Let's cut this data another way. If we look within South Africa, now bearing in mind that when National Department of Health divides up the health budget and sends it to the different provinces. Shri can maybe correct me on this, but, uh, but uh, when national department divides up the money that they send to the different departments, they give it per capita. So each province gets the same rands per capita um, in order to spend on healthcare. And the Western Cape maternal mortality is around 70 per 100,000. And in the free state, which is just a few hours away, it's 180. Two and a half times higher in a, in a province just a few hours down the road from us. Um, with the same money, which is a different system. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we, we, we need to ask ourselves some questions about why that is, about um, what's happening that, that means uh, with the same equipment and the same toys, maternal mortality is so much worse. Um, and I think it has something to do with, I, with, with a concept that I call, um, excuse me, 
uh, which, that I call uh, uh, the perfect storm. So this is a photo of Cape Town and a winter storm coming in. It's taken by a friend of mine, James Welsh. You can get his prints if you want. Um, but we have a perfect storm in our country. If you think of medical school, if you think of how we educate doctors and, and to an extent other healthcare professionals, um, but I think doctors have got it worst. Um, our whole system is affected by how we assess and our whole assessment process in, in medical school and in postgraduate education is very weighted towards an exit exam. And so the message, the curriculum is the way to be a good doctor is to know the most. And maybe the hidden curriculum is uh, not only must you know the most, but you must also be able to do the, the fanciest operation. Um, and what we're not doing is talking about if you know the most, or if you know stuff, how do you make sure that you deliver care that is in line with what you know? There's a difference between knowing what to do and actually doing it. There's, there's a gap between policy and practice, between guidelines and what's done on the ground, um, between knowing how and doing. Um, and I think if you, if you reflect on what you've seen in the hospitals where you've worked, and you're honest with yourself, you'll acknowledge that best standard of care, it's probably known to many of the practitioners who are working and looking after a particular patient, but we never deliver it, or we seldom deliver it. And we don't talk about that enough. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to ask uh, you guys to kind of participate in, in a thought experiment here. Um, you know, humans are not as rational as we think. Uh, and we do funny things all the time. So I want to ask you, um, just think about how many of you broke the speed limit in the last month? I'm going to suggest it's quite a few. But you know that it's dangerous. You know that it's bad for you and for other people. How many of you drink too much coffee knowing that it's bad for you? How many of you eat too much chocolate? Here's one that hurts me a lot. How many of you have shouted at a friend, a partner, a child, my poor children, uh, knowing that that's actually not really a helpful way to interact with him. The point is that as humans, it's quite hard to do the right thing uh, all the time. But, and, and here I have to agree with Srikant completely, I think we have a secret weapon. And, and, and so for me in the healthcare system, you know, how are we going to bridge the policy to practice gap? We need a unicorn. Uh, and the unicorn is absolutely, it's the human. It's, the, it's the, the healthcare worker in the system. They are the most valuable asset. They are our, um, uh, our most powerful weapon. Um, but even unicorns can't bridge the policy to practice gap um, unless they have wings. And, and, and so I, I am firmly, I believe wholeheartedly, uh, I'm rapidly growth mindset that if we invest in the humans within the system, we can give them wings and we can give them wings and, and we can get them to bridge the policy to practice gap in functional teams. Okay. Now, now what are the tools that we need to help these unicorns uh, learn to grow wings and bridge the policy to, to practice gap? Well, as I said before, I, I'm not sure that I'm well placed to give you guys a tour de force of behavior change theory and science, but there are some tools out there that I think are really accessible uh, and, and easy to start using um, that we don't talk about enough. And so, you know, we, we look at places where practice isn't as we, as we want it to be. And the solution is always, let's do some training. Let's put somebody in a classroom and tell them what to do. Well, here's the thing guys, telling people what to do, doesn't result in behavior change. You know, you were all kids being told what to do by your parents. Did you do it? No. I was a medical student being told to go home and read every night, did I? No. Um, uh, telling people what to do doesn't work. And so, so I'm going to just mention three tools. So, so um, you may have heard of organizational development uh, as a kind of way of thinking about changing organizations and dialogic organizational development as a kind of branch of that um, and, and it espouses the, the theory that um, conversation, dialogue, 
uh, is part of the change. And that if you're talking about your system, if you're talking about your organization, uh, and if you work hard at making sure that those conversations are powerful conversations, you are already executing change or affecting change. Uh, Shri has mentioned quality improvement methodologies. So, so you know, that the Institute for Health Improvement are kind of the grandfathers of, of this concept and way of thinking. Uh, and it's really, at the base, it's really simple tools that can be used and a very simple methodology that can be used to try and affect change uh, in complex systems. Um, and, then, and then another tool that, that is very close to my heart and something that I um, work hard at uh, frequently is insight your simulation. So if you want functional teams, uh, uh, if you want them to understand the environment they work in, if you want them to test the environment they work in, get them to practice doing what they do in the environment where they do it. Those of you who've played sport will know that you used to go to practice and not play matches. You used to do drills. Why were you doing drills? You were simulating the match. You were simulating match uh, situations in a way that helped you learn faster than if you just went and played matches every day. No high acuity um, industry, whether it's space, military, uh, rescue, um, none of them uh, have ever waited for strong evidence to support simulation. They know that's a good idea. And we should be doing more simulated uh, testing of systems and training uh, in our systems. So what does it look like in practice? Well, you, you guys will recognize Chris. Uh, so we had a problem. Um, uh, you, you may or may not have been aware that there's been a pandemic on. Um, and, and so in, in March of this year, uh, or things kind of started getting a bit hot. And in April, um, Mark Mendelssohn said, we need to try and make infection prevention control uniform across Kreska Hospital in order to keep healthcare workers safe. And, and keeping, protecting healthcare workers, keeping them physically and mentally safe is a theme that's been, um, that's played out across the whole uh, metro and in fact across the whole world uh, at the moment. And, and we realized that um, it was gonna be very hard using just the three IPC nurses that Kreska has to kind of affect change across the whole um, platform. And so Project Team Care, uh, which is a, a project that I'm uh, co-lead on, stepped up to the plate and said, look, we will try and um, manage this process. And if you think of those methods that I spoke about, the organizational development, the insight and simulation, and quality improvement methodology, we, we, we thought, let's do a PDSA cycle uh, and, and let's try some things. And so we, we got volunteer coaches and we deployed them into 20 or 30 clinical areas um, and another sort of 10 to 20 non-clinical areas in the hospital. Volunteers from within healthcare care staff, we gave them very little training in how to be a coach and what coaching methodology meant. Um, we used some QR methodology to measure what we were doing and try to understand whether we were making a difference or not. And, and in the end, what we ended up creating was a team of deliberate listeners, people who put themselves at the interface where work happens and listened and just try to understand what the problems were there, took those messages up to management and took man ma messages from management down to the um, work interface. Um, and, and how did we do? Well, um, we, we try to measure whether PPE and other IPC resources were available. And I think you can tell from this graph that we didn't really see a huge change in how much hand sanitizer was available, how many boxes of gloves were available. Although from our qualitative feedback, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was huge amounts of anxiety around availability of PPE. And after a month or two of um, being active, that narrative really changed and people no longer were concerned about having the PPE, they felt like they had it. Um, we tried to measure whether people were practicing distancing. Um, uh, so <clears throat> the first week we only had one um, audit and so that, that, that first figure with the question marks on doesn't really reflect anything, but I think we had an upward trend in terms of people keeping their distance in clinical and social areas. Um, <clears throat> we audited hand hygiene through observing people's behavior um, and using simple quality improvement techniques, the circled area suggests that we had made a meaningful, well, a meaningful difference had been effected. Whether that was due to project team care or not, uh, we cannot say. And I'd, I'd like to think that there are lots of other complex influences on that. Uh, I wouldn't um, pretend to imply a causal relationship. Um, we also try to compare our figures with those of um, the healthcare worker infection rates. 
Um, so just the, those two graphs on the left are all healthcare worker infections at, at Hrvatsky Hospital, uh, and on the right are where admissions of COVID positive patients or, or, or PUIs into the hospital. Um, and you can see on the right-hand graph, the peak dropped off on the 6th of July, but on the left-hand graph, we'd already started seeing a drop off in acute num in numbers of healthcare work infections before we hit the peak of admissions. So maybe, maybe we were able to effect a change um, in healthcare worker infections or a, a, a change was seen. Um, but again, quite hard data to know whether we made a real difference. But I, I showed display today to just try and give an idea of how you can use QI methodology and QI data to try and understand whether you're making a difference or not. The other uh, measure we, 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 did, we looked at was absenteeism per month. I think this is an amazing, uh, interesting graph. So on the, on the left hand, uh, the, the, the y-axis is uh, absenteeism per month, number of staff sick in blue and number of sick days taken per month in yellow. And if you see over 2019, a slow decrease perhaps in absenteeism um, towards the end of the year. And then suddenly as the pandemic hits, a real drop off in absenteeism and days uh, and there is sick leave taken. Um, uh, you can see where team care started. Perhaps there was a further drop off. Uh, we're not sure. But isn't that amazing that um, during a time where healthcare workers were under the most threat, we had less people off sick and less people being absent um, than before, which I really think speaks to just how resilient uh, and amazing our, our staff are. So if we reflect on Project Team Care's pandemic uh, response, you know, did it work? Well, I think the qualitative data would suggest that we have had um, important effects on staff wellness, uh, some important effects on availability of PPE, um, but we're uncertain about effects on, on healthcare worker infection rates. Um, if you look at the quantitative data, can we sustain it? So, so the, 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 the honest answer is no, not in the current format. Um, and it, so it requires us to deliberately hand over responsibility for this project from the coaches to the local ward uh, leadership. Can we scale it? Uh, again, we're going to need a kind of change in the way we deliver the service if we're going to be able to scale it. Um, and so there's quite a lot of um, work happening at the moment. We, we've we, um, involved with an app company and we, we're loading content onto the app and we're having to launch the app as soon as we can get uh, through the regulatory hoops. Um, and so what are the next steps? Well, a deliberate handover of responsibility, launching of the app, um, and we're going to try and measure a third uh, important outcome, which is emotional wellness of, of staff through an emotional, uh, emotional pulse check. That's just a very quick overview of an attempt to unleash teams during a very unusual time um, through the deployment of coaches to uh, really kind of change people's understanding of their role within the system and try and light a flame within people working at the coalface to understand that they can be change agents, that they can make a difference. And it was not through telling them what to do or showing them what to do. It was through trying to convince them that they could do it themselves, to bring them, to help themselves uh, create a realization that they could make a difference. So what happens if we move beyond Kuritsky? What happens if we look at some other projects? So, so, so here's, here's a question I, I want you guys to reflect on. This is Madwaleni Hospital um, in rural uh, Eastern Cape. Um, and this is Zitulele Hospital, which is about two hours away, also in rural Eastern Cape. If, if you're interested in seeing a different system, if you're interested in understanding what um, healthcare in South Africa really looks like, um, I can't, uh, I can't, um, recommend going to these hospitals enough. Uh, so, so we vi visited these hospitals a while ago um, and we spent some time with the staff there with a particular focus on kind of global surgery um, uh, questions. A and we said to them, um, you know, what operation do we need to do next? Um, and so I'm gonna pose that to you guys. Uh, we, at Zitulele, they felt strongly that the most important next operation for them to tackle is uh, uh, open reduction and fixation of tib, tib fib fractures. So tibia fibula fractures, they felt that in rural, um, in their area, you know, if somebody breaks an arm and there's a malunion, they still, that person's 
life quality is not great, but they can still get around, they can still be okay. But if your leg breaks and you can no longer walk, you are stuck in a hut without any public transport, without any way of getting around, without any way of being able to do any livelihood. It really is debilitating. And they, they have, you know, because of the terrain that they live in, they have lots of really bad leg fractures and they keep sending them to Tata and they don't get fixed properly. Um, and so they want to be able to fix tip foot fractures. And so my, my, my poser to you, my thought experiment to you is, um, what, how do we unleash the teams there to be able to learn and perform tip foot fractures? Madrileni Hospital is unable to perform laparotomies for ectopic pregnancies. And so their patients who present with ectopics, um, and they have very sophisticated ultrasound um, diagnostic skills there, they make really high quality diagnoses of ectopic pregnancies. They have to wait for an ambulance to come from Tata, minimum two hours away, pick them up, take them back to Tata, minimum two hours journey back. When they get to Tata Hospital, they still have to navigate the system in order to get treatment. If you're bleeding from an ectopic and you've got a minimum five hour wait before you get your operation. So again, how do we go to Madrileni Hospital uh, and help them learn to do ectopic surgery? Um, so I hope that I've kind of prodded your thinking around um, how we harness human potential in global surgery, how we unleash teams. I hope I've prodded you about some of the complexity around um, changing behavior and helping people learn. Um, but I hope also that you have realized that it is possible to light the flame uh, within our workforce, that it is possible to help people reframe themselves from just people who come to work and do as they're told to change agents, to leaders, uh, to people who can actually effect change in the environment where they work. So thanks again for having me guys. Um, and I'm happy to talk about any of this. Uh, please contact me uh, on those details. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Days. Um, I think hearing from you and Dr. Peters has been probably the most hopeful of the global surgery webinars so far. Uh, so far we've been inundated with a lot of uh, very stressful and dire facts and thinking. And, and this has been really great to sort of see that we've laid out the problem. This is what needs to happen. But here's our, here are proven effective exciting ways to challenge these these hurdle, these hurdles and obstacles that we're facing and i think that's where the heart of this first question comes in and i think it can go to both of you if you can both comment um thank you for highlighting the importance of teams and achieving change and improving quality access to healthcare many would agree that in south africa and perhaps even in the broader african continent we have a leadership and political crisis how do we unleash teams when these leaders are halting the progress? Shrikant, do you want to come in with a political angle there? Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, do you be politically correct? Um, uh, it's always management's fault, isn't it? And, and um, uh, that's that's the line I took as an intern, and I never thought I'd be a medical manager. And uh, sometimes cringe when I say the words, but uh, we have to lead. Um, wherever you are, you have to lead. Um, and and I'm not saying that makes you uh, authoritative in what you do. It doesn't mean that you're the person that knows everything. It means that you open yourself up to making these decisions, being vulnerable. Um, and saying, I don't know, this is not my field of expertise. I am animated by the idea of improving the system, increasing agency of my fellow healthcare workers, and I can see the problem. I might not know the solution, but I can measure the problem and I can work together with people who are similarly passionate like me and together we can increase our own agency and we don't have to sit back and just say that the system stinks. Um, and, and I think that's, that's uh, even when you were, you, you were saying this is one of the most hopeful talks, I sort of cringed inside. Uh, but there is a process and a method that doesn't mean that it's easy. Um, and, and there's lots of days where you just, it's an absolute nightmare to get through the working day. 
and, and you, you, you butt your heads against people that don't see the problem, don't understand what you're saying, and, and don't agree with your solution. Um, but if you believe in your cause, and if you have team members that you can trust and work with, um, then what gets measured gets managed eventually, and you have data and evidence um, that you can work with. And it, it helps to break things, these huge problems in the system. If you take it back down to what, I'm, what can I do in my sphere of influence, like Rowan is doing now, um, and, and how can you put ripples into the system that eventually take over time? And that's how you eventually get functional systems. You don't see the little ripples from the people. You eventually see groups of functional teams working together and at medical school, when you're in a tertiary academic environment, you don't necessarily appreciate those things, except when you go outside and, and see the lack of those things. Um, so yeah, it, it does, it, as cliche as it sounds, it means that we all need to take up leadership, but that just means we all need to be vulnerable and be willing to take the first step. Um, so thanks, Shrikant. Uh, you know, um, Shrikant always brings a system and analysis uh, approach to these things, and I'm, you know, I'm far more like, like, give me a pickaxe and tell me, show me the rock to hit. Uh, so, 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 um, yes, uh, we work in a really frustrating country because of um, top leadership. Um, but I wake up every day, and I'm grateful that I work at Kruitsky Hospital in the west, in, in the Western Cape. Um, so. You may not have had the privileged access that I had to Bronze Command. Uh, and I sat in those committee meetings once a week. They happen three times a week. Um, so that's, that's Bhavna Patel, CEO of the Khrushchev Hospital, and all of her um, managers um, of all the services in the hospital. Um, you know, four and a half thousand staff, and, and these are all, all the managers. Yo. And they just said, we can do, we will do. And the clinician said, we need more wards. And they said, fine, we'll do it. And Bhavna sat there going, um, we're opening another ICU unit next week. Um, Susan, do you have ventilators for me? Uh, not yet, but I'll have them on Friday. Simon, do you have syringe pumps for me? Um, not yet. Why don't you have syringe pumps for me? Get syringe pumps for me. Uh, somebody needs beds. Somebody find a truck and go to the bed shop and get the beds. But it was just... Whatever people wanted, whatever clinicians wanted, um, the, the, the feeling there was, we're gonna make it happen. Um, and, and I think if COVID has, you know, one of the lessons that COVID is taught, you know, we're all looking for the um, silver lining. Um, but for a long time, the healthcare system has felt absolutely crystalline, absolutely stagnant. And, I've, and you know, if I think what is the most frustrating, what's the thing that drives promising clinicians, healthcare workers away from South Africa or away from public practice in South Africa, it's system impotence. Yo, that is so hard. Um, that you come to work every day and you butt your head against the same problem. Well, what has COVID shown us? That the whole system can be absolutely flipped on its head, like wildness can happen. Uh, and in response to, you know, and we had like weeks, weeks to kind of change the way we do work, change patient flow, change how we deliver um, services. It wasn't perfect. Like we made lots of mistakes. Um, but the service is not as crystalline as we think. Um, and guess what? It's not only in the Western Cape. Zitulele and Madweleni, those two hospitals in the ruralist of rural Eastern Cape. And they have changed the way they deliver service. So, so yes, it's going to be hard for us to change what happens at the level of the Minister of Health but there's one minister of, of health and there are hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers working at the in interface. That's a lot of change agents. That's a lot of pressure brought to bear to change the system. Um, and so th the last thing I would say is, um, and this is something that, you know, I'm sure she kind of is aware of that. I believe we have clinicians, healthcare workers who want to make the system better. That's why they're here. I believe we have managers who want to make the system better. That's why they're here. But there is a huge communication gulf. Um, and so if you believe in dialogic organizational development, if you believe in human development, if you want to make a difference, start talking and more importantly, start listening. Um, uh, get out there, talk to the people you work with, talk to the, um, 
the people from different cadres, from different uh, uh, prof professions in your clinical environments, find out what, what makes them tick. Um, and then go and knock on doors in management. Most of those doors will open. Um, and if they're not open, push harder. Uh, because people, they actually, they, yeah, there we go, Shri, thank you. They, 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 <laughs> they, they actually, um, management's desperate to know what's happening on the shop floor um, and they're desperate to help. So, yeah, uh, it's not all doom and gloom, but it, but it ain't easy. It is a hack, it is a hustle. Um, but there's, there's a few of us out there who you can join forces with. Yeah, thank you so much for like the great advice from both of you. I think that's really helpful. Um, I think that goes into another more granular topic, um, which is like, what is the minimum requirements for safe surgery? And what sort of physical equipment, what is the impact of physical equipment on the ability of teams to perform the surgery that they need? And given resource constraints and resource differences, do we scrap best practices that are practiced in other more resource rich environments? Or do we modify them or do we find the resources to do them the way that they say it must be done? Uh, Srikant, I, I, this might be more your wheelhouse, but you look like you've frozen. Um, I, I think the response has got, it's got to be con context specific, right? Um, safe surgery can be an amputation that happens under gunfire in a theater of war with a bit of ketamine sedation uh, and a giggly saw uh, and some compression bandages. Um, that can be safe in, in the context. Um, so, so if you haven't heard of straight access technology, get out there and Google it now. Straight access technology is a, um, an offshoot of the um, Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery. They're based in the Hatta Institute. They are designing heart valves that are going to cost $50. that can be inserted by non-specialists via femoral access without any imaging equipment. That's the vision. How far are they? They're, they're putting the, they've put their first valves into humans, not via open heart surgery, but the first trial in man has happened. These are South African African scientists um, coming up with solutions that are going to provide best quality care uh, to the people of Africa in a way that high income countries have not been able to. Um, but yes, we need to make decisions all the time around uh, balance of risks and balance of resources. But I think we can still, in, we can still deliver um, high enough um, for, you know, we're right at the margin of where great surgery and great outcomes can happen. Yeah, thank you. That's amazing. Uh, since Sri is, or Dr. Peters is gone, I'll I'm back. I'm back. end off with uh, one. Oh, you're back. Okay. Yes. I'll end off with a question that uh, relates mostly to uh, Dr. Dace's presentation, but I know both of you are passionate about this. Um, Dr. Dace, you, you gave us a beautiful illustration of this unicorn, and then you have this policy and you have practice. Um, how do we move, and how do we best, most quickly, most effectively move from the policy to the practice as individuals and as team members, as leaders? Right, so, so look, the first, I think the first point in the game is acknowledge that there's a problem. And the second thing is measure it. Uh, and I'm sure Srikant will uh, support me there. Um, you know, unless we are kind of really being honest and reflecting on the practice we're delivering and going, you know, that isn't where it, where it should be, um, uh, we're not going to make a difference. Uh, so have honest conversations with yourself, with your teams, with your, with your superiors, with your uh, people that you lead and say, guys, we're not delivering what we should. Um, and, and clinical audits, I just don't think is a tool that we use enough in this country. Uh, we should be really examining hard what is, is that we're doing, what our outcomes are. Um, uh, and then I suppose the next tip, the next goal is distributed leadership, uh, local ownership. Um, uh, yeah, uh, solutions aren't easy, um, but, but I think that's a good place to start. Sri? Yeah, um, sorry everyone, uh, 
But um, I, I would take exactly what Rowan said and, 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 and give it a system spin. Yeah, um, coming, at, uh, coming at medicine as an intern and saying to myself, this should not be the way it is. And this ventilator should not have changed settings from pediatric to adult in the middle of the night and killed this child. Um, so there's a story about safe um, equipment. Um, and, and the system should run in a specific way. Um, you take that mindset into public health spaces and into management. But I think what people tend to forget, as passionate as they are, is that we can't have individual ownership of solutions. That, that is a recipe for disaster. Um, um, and, and, and the whole um, system of standard setting and quality improvement needs to be owned by clinicians. There's no point having national core standards which are put in place by health ministers and administrators. I need my clinicians to tell me what is going wrong every single day because nobody knows better than them. And there needs to be a two-way street between um, uh, management and clinicians into setting standards, improving systems, um, and that goes for human resources, goes for equipment ordering. You shouldn't see yourself once you qualify as just a, a, a highly technically trained clinical expert. Uh, I mean, it might be very fun, um, but at the end of the day, you want to have input into the systems uh, that you're working in and you want to see your, your, your working environment transform. And that's where you get a lot of um, work satisfaction. But in order to do that, management needs to allow you to grow and lead and manage your own spaces. Um, and, and so that's really what we need. We need distributed leadership. Um, we need management and clinicians to talk to each other and understand each other. Managers need to, need to be clinically trained. I do agree with that. Clinicians need to understand how to manage themselves, their teams, and how to advance change. And in public health, we say what gets measured gets managed. And clinicians are the ones who need to show us what are the problems we need to focus on. Thank you so much to both of you for excellent presentations and a really good discussion. Um, I think, yeah, there, there are probably a few managers in this room that are feeling challenged and ready to go and listen to their clinicians. And hopefully there are a few young doctors and future doctors who are ready to excitedly step into their role as uh, clinical practitioners and also agents of change. And I really appreciate both of you for bringing that in. I'm gonna hand over to Prof. Maswime if she is here to uh, say some words before handing over to Savannah. Prof, are you there? Yes, I am. Great. So, thank, thank you so much to two excellent speakers. I mean, today, like Regan said earlier, was really inspiring. And also thank you to, to Prof Vegan as well for, for opening in such an inspiring way. And I think what's really special about today was, is, is you know, the global surgery movement has built a lot on principles around access to surgical care. But, you know, the more we've done this, the more we've realized that it's not just about access and creating more hospitals and training more surgeons. It's about the, the quality of care that is offered. And just like uh, Rowan highlighted, patients die when we don't have functional health systems. Patients die when we don't have teams that are functional, that are working well together. So I think two points that I took from, from you guys and two really uh, points that I enjoyed because they really make us vulnerable as, as, as people, but just that one surgery doesn't op happen on its own. You know, there's, there are managers, there are people that need to put the equipment and everything that happens, that happens in, in, in theatre. So it's making sure that there are people that, that get the teams together, making sure that they've got adequate teams, adequate supplies, adequate everything. And a lot of medical students don't think about that. A lot of clinicians that I know don't think about that. But it's so important, uh, Shrikant, what you do and what you've highlighted to help everyone start thinking about, about that. But also, Ron, what you mentioned, that surgeons are just ordinary people at the end of the day. We're all medical doctors who are afraid, who are vulnerable, sometimes tired and just don't want to come to work. And I think with the pandemic, you highlighted, well, the fears drove people to stay at home. And, and there was a lot of absenteeism, lots of people not wanting to, to come because of, you know, obviously their fears and, and everything that was happening. So it's, it's important for us to, to, to know those things and to be honest and open about that. 
but most importantly, to create uh, functional teams to work together. Because when you work well together, we improve our outcomes. We, we're able to improve outcomes for patients, we improve the quality of surgical care. So I'll close off by just, again, highlighting we can all be change, change, change agents. We can all do something that's going to improve outcomes. We can all contribute towards improving the system. So thank you very much to all of you keep joining these seminars we've got three more exciting seminars as well and keep joining join joining them and and being part of these discussions so handing over to you Savannah. Thank you, Prof. Masume, for tying together all the important points that were raised by Dr. Dace and Dr. Peters this evening. Um, on behalf of the UCT Surgical Society, I also wanted to say a big thank you to our two speakers for coming this evening to speak to us on the importance of management and health systems and really just empowering teams in the surgical context. So thank you, Dr. Peters, for giving us insight into health systems as well as underlining some core public health principles and how they really relate to operating theatres and um, theatre management. I really think that public health specialists and as Prof. Masume said, theatre manage managers really play an important role in ensuring that we um, provide accessible but also high quality care to our patients. And so we really don't get a lot of exposure to this as medical students. And so we really appreciate your expertise this evening. And then Dr. Dace, I really enjoyed your focus on teams and really unleashing the human potential in the surgical context. Um, I love the observation that you made at the beginning of your talk where you said that too much emphasis is placed on who knows the most and who knows the most complicated surgical procedure or surgical technique and rather that emphasis should be placed on how you add in value with what you know to the healthcare system and how are you becoming an agent of change. So I think we're all feeling really, really inspired to take what we've learned this evening and become agents of change in the real world. So before we close off, I just have some important announcements to make. The first announcement is that our next talk will be happening mid to end September. The date has not yet been confirmed, so please keep checking our social media platforms for updates. But we will have Prof Fegan and a health economist speaking to us about leadership and finances and surgery, which is another very important topic. So we hope to see you all there. For the next very exciting announcement, I'm just quickly going to share my screen. Okay. So the Southern African Student Surgical Society and the UCT Division of Global Surgery will be having a virtual collaborative conference on the 10th to the 11th of October 2020 entitled Reimagining Perioperative Care in Africa. So this conference is open to all students and healthcare professionals and there will be a research competition and a theory of change workshop for the students and then a one day conference program that's open to all students, healthcare professionals with a world class lineup of speakers covering an array of different topics within surgery and global surgery in our own African context. So please be sure to just follow our social media platforms for more information. This is going to definitely be the conference of the year. I have no doubt about it. So don't miss out um, and be sure to keep checking for when we release our tickets next week. Lastly, thank you so much to all of our local and international speakers for joining us this evening. We really trust that you enjoyed the talk and we hope to see you at the next one coming up in September. Enjoy the rest of your evening and you can now leave the meeting. Thank you.